Hello, my name is Martin and welcome back to another video. So, where are we now? Is this uh, lockdown number three, is it? If you don't count last week's live stream that descended into absolute retro TV madness. And I do apologise if I lost some of you at that point, but uh, I was having quite a good time. It was a bit of a laugh, so never mind, we'll move on and we're going to crack on and get serious again in this video, definitely. And I've also got some time off coming up. Um, just after next week, so I'm determined to go out and do my hours exercise but I might take a camera with me because I've got some ideas of a video we can do and I'm absolutely getting sick now of sitting in the house and I've not been taking the hours exercise that I'm entitled to so we're going to have to go out and do a video I think in the very near future Now, you may or may not have noticed I've decided to go for a DIY haircut down to the wood, low maintenance, uh, I hope you like it, if you don't it's going to take about six months to grow out but it just kept getting <laughs> it just kept getting shorter and shorter and I think when you do it yourself and you can't see the back best trick is just to go as short as possible and any mistakes are only minor anyway let's crack on, so what have we got coming up in this video today well we've got this, this, this and this so let's crack on and get serious again this week. Um, I'm going to take you to back to last year, July 2019, and something else a film that never ended up being a video. It was the Manchester International Festival, and there was all sorts of events on. Music events, food events, and historical walks and tours. And guess which one I booked on? the historical walk and tour. It was called a drunk pandemic and I was a bit baffled by it. I couldn't work out what it was. Just so happens a friend of mine called David that I used to work with had booked on the same one. So we met up at Manchester Victoria Station. Now eventually the group was taken round to the back of the station and we ended up walking along Walker's Croft. Walker's Croft is quite a fascinating place because or it would have been a fascinating place because it used to be a little lane that went alongside of the River Irk. The River Irk has since been culverted over and now it's just a cobbled street. But I think back and I thought, I, thought, I bet it, this was a right eerie lane that went alongside of the, uh, the river with the old Chetham School to the right of it. It now uh, hits a dead end at Victoria Station or the undercroft of Victoria Station. Um, there was a big gate there and we got taken through it as you can see from the picture so a drunk pandemic turns out what it was was a a bit of a mishmash thing really it was a talk on cholera and um, there was a Japanese art group there doing an installation the installation was bizarre because what they were doing was they were making bricks out of piss <laughs> right, so they were, they, they were inviting you to, to have a wee in the toilet and the wee went down into down a pipe into a big tank where they distilled the urine somehow and they were making bricks to do another art installation elsewhere um, they were also making beer and no they didn't mix the wee with the beer but they were brewing beer in the undercroft of Manchester Victoria Station so already you can see this was quite a bizarre thing I think it was a, a Japanese art group called Chimpo Art. I'll just check that for you. Hang on a second. Yep, there it is. Chimpom Art. I'll put the link below. Um, it's a Japanese website, but if you want to, you can read about the uh, installation that I went to. So you get the idea. It was quite bizarre. Now, I found myself in the undercroft of Manchester Victoria Station. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute, and I'm going to show you what we saw. But obviously, me being in the undercroft of Manchester Victoria Station, it was quite fascinating. We got this talk on cholera, and it got me thinking about the way it fitted in, really. It was quite uncanny. The way it fitted in with the things we look at in the videos, the old housing and things like that. And quite often, I'll touch on the old buildings and the maps, but it's not that often that I'll talk about the sort of social issues. And I got quite fascinated with cholera, so I thought I'd just discuss for a moment cholera with you and how it's fascinated me and interested me um, because there's nothing like a bit of cholera of an evening is there so let's chat cholera so cholera arrived in Britain in 1831 via a ship that docked in the port of Sunderland six months later it hit Manchester 
Now, 1831, 1832, what was Manchester like? Well, I can only imagine, I'm not a historian, but it was the death of the cottage industry, wasn't it? People were moving in from rural areas because of the, the factories that were springing up in Manchester and in other towns and cities, and there was work there. Unfortunately, one of the afterthoughts was housing. So like just like today, unscrupulous builders and landlords bought up swathes of land and started to throw up this uh, poor quality housing, quite a bit of which we've looked at in some of our videos in the archaeological digs. Unfortunately, fresh water and sanitation was, it wasn't even an afterthought, it just wasn't even a thought. Um, and that's where we get Engels describing these slum areas of these standing pools of filth and stinking offal. Um, an interesting thing that I was reading recently, I was reading a book about, uh, I think it was about the Irish in Manchester, and it was talking about the areas where they lived in Angel Meadow and Little Island. And I never thought of it like this, but what they said was that if you think about Irk Town, which, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was the uh, sort of Angel Meadow and it was on a, uh, it was on a slope down towards the, the River Irk. It was on the valley of the River Irk. Now, the more expensive houses were at the top of the hill and the cheaper ones were at the bottom of the hill. And the reason being was that all the slurry and all the um, sewage and everything that was gonna run downhill ended up pooling at the bottom of the street or the bottom of the road. And therefore, it was more desirable to, desirable to live at the top of the street than at the bottom, and this is where you got these standing pools of awful filth and stench. Um, I've got a real morbid curiosity, to be honest with you. But anyway, how did it hit Manchester? Well, the first person to uh, die of cholera in Manchester, apparently, was a gentleman called James Palfreyman. He was 29 years old, and it's 1832 now. It's said that he started off with stomach cramps, nausea and diarrhea. Within two days he was dead. Now he was also described as quite a stout, well-proportioned fellow. So people were shocked at the way it had brought down, this, this strange illness had brought down this quite healthy young man of 29 years of age. Now from there it obviously spread and became an epidemic. One of the things it was known as was the blue fear. Um, and the reason was, was because there was entire families that were affected by it and people could go out to work of an early morning and somebody in the, in the household had been not very well, they'd come home in the evening and that person was dead. And then the rest of the household got the illness as well, cholera. Now, it was called the Blue Fear. That was one of the name, one of many names that it got. Uh, and I think the reason it was called that was because the people that died of it just before death took on this bluish grayish appearance i can well imagine that they basically died of diarrhea and vomiting to be honest with you horrendous death so imagine they were very very dehydrated they lost a lot of the circulating volume of blood they started to peripherally shut down what blood they had left was concentrated into the center and all the uh, peripheries like i say was uh, starting to look a little bit grayish bluish and they took on this deathly look about them. So it was known as the blue fear. And people didn't know what it was. Um, they, they, they felt, I think some of the more learned people knew something to do with poor people and everyone living together because as per usual, it was mainly poor people that got it because of the cramped and horrendous conditions that they lived in but they thought it was something to do with bad air. And some of the doctors at the time studied the way that the, um, there was no light getting into some of the cellar rooms and there was only one door and they thought this was possibly the cause of it. We now know better. Rich people thought it was um, only immoral people that got cholera, but of course they weren't as affected because um, they were living in better housing conditions. Now, one of the interesting things, it was noted that people who drank a lot of beer or who worked in breweries tended not to get cholera. And there was good reason for this. If you use the local well, it was quite probable that the water that you was pumping up from the well was probably contaminated 
with sewage. Now it was noted that people who worked in breweries or people that drank a lot of beer as the main source of fluid tended not to get cholera. It took a while to work this out and the question was asked why and the reason is is because the water for the beer had been boiled and there's a certain antiseptic quality apparently that hops have as well. So this suddenly became a thing this to drink a lot of beer. So people were drinking all day long, they were drinking in the mornings, they were giving it to the children and beer was prescribed medicinally by the doctors as well. Now we're not talking strong beer, we're talking beer about one or two percent so you had to drink a lot of it to get drunk but this was the first sort of like inkling that the, uh, the cholera came from the drinking sources and a much safer option was to drink beer. Eventually this got a pin cholera down and it was the work of a Dr John Snow in London in about 1849 who stood at one particular well and tried to, it was early epidemiology, he tried to trace where uh, people in a certain area were getting the water from because he was convinced that it came from water. So he was looking at where they got the water from and he traced these people um, and traced them all back to one particular well and of course the well was contaminated. It was actually the person that um, pinned down the actual causative agent, the bacterium that caused cholera, was a gentleman came, called Filippo Pacini and he was from Italy uh, and he was uh, around in 1854 he did that. Later somebody in Britain called Robert Koch, Dr Robert Koch, sought that work further onwards. So there you go, I just thought I'd talk about cholera because it really fascinated me and it interested in me and it was all about that at that time isn't it, 1830s, the start of the railways, late Georgian, early Victorian era quite a fascinating time. Anyway, let's go down to Manchester Victoria Station uh, and I've got a little bit of footage I'm going to show you um, of the undercroft of the station and the art installation by Chimpo, Chimpom Art. So I'll talk you through this now. So there you go, you'll see Walker's Croft there in the middle of the uh, map and below it you'll just see Cheatham's Hospital and Library. Now in between those two is the River Irk. It's currently covered over, it's culverted and we've been down there in a previous video. But at one time Walker's Croft probably would have been a riverside walk when the river was, uh, was were ran open in that area. Above you'll see Victoria Station and just where it says uh, the word station, that was where the Walker's Croft Cemetery was. Now Walker's Croft Cemetery was famous at the time for having its mass and open graves where they would put a layer of coffins, a loose layer of earth and leave it open for a while and then put another layer of coffins on top and you can imagine the stench that came from the area. A lot of the people that were buried in these mass graves were obviously cholera victims. This is a picture of Walker's Croft today and as you'll see it's a little cobble street and if we turn around this picture shows where it ends at the Undercroft to Manchester Victoria station. Now we were invited through that door and into the Undercroft of the station so let's take a look at what's going on. So this is one of the members of the Chimpom art group and he's making bricks and behind him is a big tank of wee. Um, he's making the bricks for another installation. Quite bizarre it was, the whole thing was bizarre as you can see. Uh, you can see he's making the bricks by hand and he's made quite a few because this picture will show you how many he's made. Now that is Walker's Croft but Walker's Croft underneath the station and we think that went up to a ramp that eventually came out up on the, the station. Obviously I had, had a bit of scuttle round and uh, look round under there, stairways to nowhere. How interesting is that? I wonder where that went to. Now as I said they were also brewing beer down there, they had these big vats and I managed to get a bit of an aerial view of the beer brewing and it was uh, pretty good actually. Uh, the, like I said there was no wee wee in it, that was for the bricks. And then when we came out there was a little pop-up bar and this is me with a member of Chimpom Art who was serving bottles of beer and we all had a bottle of beer and went on our way. Now if we just jump back, this is the interesting bit and the bit that falls into the urban exploring and everything that we do on the channel because when we went into the undercroft of Manchester Victoria Station 
immediately on the right, lit in rather attractive red lights, was the bridge. What bridge am I on about? Well, if you watch my videos, when I went down into the River Irk culvert, we looked up at a, a bridge that was in the culvert that is rumoured to be a cattle bridge from the 1600s. Now, I doubted that, and I don't think it's a cattle bridge. I just think it's Victorian, and it's a utility bridge that spans from one side of the station to the other over the culvert that's hidden underneath Manchester Victoria Station. Nonetheless, the bridge is a bit legendary, and we looked up at it from the culvert, as you remember, may remember from this video. So I'm going to show you now uh, something I've wanted to do for ages, two unique views. So let's flick back now to Victoria Station. That is the door, the open up there, and look down into the river where you get underneath Victoria Station. Now, I don't know which is more terrifying, uh, being in the culvert and looking up or standing on the bridge and looking down into the, uh, the fast flowing dark water. You decide. Mm -hmm. Well, it's come out to be the steps there, hasn't it? It gives you a bit down there in the distance, so cheers. So there you go, I've been waiting to do that for ages and ages, bring those two views into a video. Uh, I was probably going to do it in a different video, but I've done it in this one. Right, ready for the second feature. So we've got a, a video that's been made for us by a member of Team Zero. I don't know if you remember, last year I went to a place called Prospect Studios in Bradford. Uh, a gentleman there called Stevie, who was a sound engineer, made some music for me. Well, I did some basic chords and he enhanced them brilliantly. Stevie has made us a video. He's got a little uh, water course that he's going to follow for us and tell us all about. So we're going over to Bradford uh, and Stevie and his dog Hicks are going to take us along a little route. And to be honest with you, it's going to be a breath of fresh air to get out and about. So over to Bradford, Stevie, tell us about this water course. My name's not Martin Zero, but welcome back to another video. Right, for obvious reasons, Martin's pretty busy at the moment. So I thought I'd take it upon myself to do a little video of uh, where I take the dog for a walk every day, because it's pretty interesting. You join me in Chaladine, just outside the city of Bradford. Beautiful location. It's pretty interesting this place as well. Not only has it got a nice woodland area for walking the dogs and stuff, it's got two reservoirs, Victorian reservoirs. One thing I particularly took away from uh, Martin's videos is how little we know about what's actually under our feet. Um, you know, all the underground rivers in Manchester and whatnot. Turns out there's some in Bradford as well. So what I'd want to do now is go to the source, 
of what's known as Chaladine Beck, which runs into Bradford Beck and then goes underneath Bradford city centre. And then from there, pretty much under the, uh, the mirror pool, if you know that in the middle of Bradford, it turns left and uh, heads off towards Salt Air and the River Air. But what I thought we'd do, similar to the Medlock series, my own little mini Medlock series, is go to the, uh, the source of the Beck and follow it as far as I can. So let's see how we get on. Just to be clear, I haven't come out especially to do this video. Um, this is where I walk the dog every day. So I'm just doing this video while I'm out. I haven't come out to do this video for obvious reasons. Also, as you can see, I don't need to go near any people and it's easy enough to avoid everyone. Anyone comes the other way, I can get right out of the way, it's fine. You may notice the uh, weather change as well with some of the different shots. I've been out for a couple of uh, a couple of different days so I can get some extra shots. Because obviously I don't want to go over how long I'm allowed outside. On a more positive note, how nice is the weather? I'm regretting this coat. Beautiful day. Isn't it? No, I'm stuck in there. Now get there. So I believe this is the source of Chelladine Beck. Small little wetland area. It's quite dry at the moment. The dog's been in and out of check and it's pretty clean, so pretty dry. So it's a bit weird because it's dry as a bone here. And then it would usually go under there, but as you can see, it's dry as a bone on this side. But on the other side, water. So where is this coming from? Ah, so, looks like we've got two sauces, nice echo, yo, yo, sorry, I'm a sound engineer, I'll just indulge my uh, passion, weird echoes and reverbs, so, I'm just going to follow this stream down, and that will lead us to Chaladine Reservoirs. So that's where I've come from. The stream comes down here and then the path splits in two and goes round the two reservoirs. Now I'm going to go to the right because there's a lot more room up the bank. If there's any people I'll be able to get right out of the way so I'm nowhere near anybody. Don't know if you can make out on the camera all the, the stonework lying in the side. 
original I assume, there's patches that look newer but I assume it's all original. Nick likes to smell the ducks on the uh, fallen tree. I usually keep him on a lead around here anyway, to be honest, he's obsessed with squirrels and he just buggers off. <laughs> it's hard to get him back sometimes. Right, morning's getting late now. There's a few more people out. So I've come away from the reservoir. They're down there. Just come away, out the way. I'm gonna come back tomorrow early in the morning and just get some more shots. I believe these reservoirs were originally built for uh, drinking water and uh, supplying a lot of mills. There's mills everywhere around here. Bradford. Lords down in that direction. Uh, but Ollerton, there's lots of mills all in this direction. A few of them knocked down now. Seabrook's, cri uh, Seabrook's crisps were pretty much over there. Uh, so, uh, I might be wrong. If I am, let me know in the comments. Martin's comments. Martin, if you know, feel free to jump in. I don't really know what I'm doing here. back the next day now back at the top reservoir which was finished in 1844 slightly bigger than the lower reservoir it's got a capacity of 197,000 cubic meters reservoir that we'll have a look at soon was finished in 1853 and has a capacity of 141,000 cubic meters. I had a check online when I got home and these reservoirs did originally provide drinking water but now no longer used for that. They were bought by Bradford Council in 1974 and now maintained just for recreational purposes. Just coming up to the first dam now. You can see the uh, the new overflow on the far side. I think the original one is underwater somewhere, which is what made these things so dangerous. So these lakes were drained in the 90s, I believe, uh, and had, I think, the new overflows installed. I'm assuming this is something to do with the original one as it's stone and not concrete. There's a good video on YouTube, if you type in Cello Dean Bradford, there's a good video that comes up that shows you when these reservoirs were empty. And yeah, I believe they installed these at the same time. This is a lot more modern concrete construction. So it was 1991 when this project was completed. Uh, they'd spent £1.2 million and they'd installed the new slipways that we can see, strengthened the embankments, refurbished the actual reservoirs themselves, cleaned them up and uh, actually lowered the water level slightly. Something I don't think they were expecting though was a load of live ammunition that they found at the bottom of the reservoir when they drained it. it must have been quite a shock. stone now. Yeah, I'm not sure whether this is originally from the Victorian era reservoir or this has been put in to look period and the reservoir was refurbished, I'm not sure. It looks nice though.
Right, I'm just at the uh, the end of the last reservoir now. Uh, there's a pumping station here, the old pumping station, and a map I want to show you, but there's a couple of lads here who uh, look quite handy and a bit, a bit violent, so... Uh, so now this is going to go down. <laughs> At the start of the video, I walked up here, up round the reservoir, down there, and then I walked round there, and came out, and then this morning we've been back round here, sorry the dog's pulling on the leader, back round here, across here, and then down there. From here the water flows out of the bottom reservoir, and Chelladine Beck carries on down here and then eventually joins up to Bradford Beck. Just walking through the field now. Down the side of the beck, the reservoir is back up that way. Just follow the stream down. And then from here, it goes underneath the main road. Back out the other side. We'll follow it down a bit further. So the river's completely disappeared now, or the back rather, completely disappeared. It comes back out on the other side of the main road, over there-ish. Right, I should probably show you on the side-by-side uh, -side map where we are now, but I haven't got one. So now for another vague description of whereabouts I am. Right, we're on the other side of the main road now. Main road's back up there. I'm just going to follow the river down now to the uh, ponds at the end that were put in in 2004-ish, I think, just to try and clean the water up a bit. Right, this wouldn't be a proper vlog without something going tits up. Uh, I've taken this camera out of my pocket and dropped the spare battery. So, and the camera's running low. So I'll find that on the way back and I'll turn the camera off now and save my battery for the ponds at the end that I want to show you. So these were installed to uh, try and clean up the stream a little bit with the water filtering through the reeds and algae and whatnot taking out particles and uh, filtering the water and leaving it nice and clean on the other side. Think of it as nature's Brita filter. So the stream runs down there now and just disappears into a tunnel under the houses. It disappears under a housing estate on Thornton Road. re-emerges the other side and uh, flows through some wasteland down towards Bradford Bank and then we'll get back to the side. Battery is getting very flat on the camera now. Right Hicks, let's go and find this battery. Well that's about it, um, thanks for watching. Sorry this isn't up to the usual standard, but I'm not really a vlogger or a historian at all. I just thought I'd try and uh, fill a gap. Uh, so yeah, I've been Not Martin Zero. Thanks for watching, see you later.
Well, that was brilliant. Thank you very much, Stevie, for going out and filming that for us. So refreshing to get out and about, and I'm telling you now, as soon as I get this time off from work, I'm going out as well, and I'm gonna do something similar. So thank you, Stevie, for making the video for us. So I think that might be a little feature where people do bits of videos and inserts for us. Having said that, another feature that we do on this Mishmash magazine style program is catching up with Team Zero. We've seen Stevie. Let's go over to a familiar face that you may know, Dean. Dean, what have you been up to during lockdown? Hello. Well, thankfully, I've been quite busy. Um, I've been working to promote my new album, Geography is a Diary. That's a shameless plug there, so um, go check it out if you've not already. Uh, I've also been working on a soundtrack for a project I'm not allowed to talk about just yet, but it's for a couple of gentlemen, some of you may be familiar with, um, all will be revealed. Uh, I've done a few more instrumental tracks for Martin, as always, and we've actually been discussing the possibility of pressing a limited number of CDs of the instrumentals. It's kind of like the Martin Zero soundtrack, if you will. Um, hopefully with artwork from Team Zero as well. Is that something you'd be interested in? Let Martin know if it is. Um, he needs a new drone and I need some new audio monitors and all profits will go back into, the into Team Zero. Um, also over the past couple of days I've finished a video profile on an infamous Stretford landmark for this channel as an insert into next week's magazine style video. Guesses as to what that could be in the comments section please. Um, anyway enough of my rambling, stay safe out there and enjoy the rest of the video. So there you go, thank you very much Dean for that, keeping us posted with what's going on. So he's, he, we were talking about doing a CD of the music uh, that Dean has done for my videos. Obviously the singer-songwriter stuff that Dean does is very different to the, uh, the scores that he does for my videos. Now he doesn't do all the music for the videos, but you will recognise some of the tracks. So we're talking about trying to get a CD together, believe it or not. Does anyone still play CDs? But you'll be able to download it or you'll be able to buy the CD. And we're going to try and get a certain somebody to do some artwork for us for the, for the CD. You're getting to sign it as well, get Dean to sign it. So we've got that in the pipeline. So uh, nice one, Dean, brilliant. Right, I'm well aware that this video is quite a long video, but I thought you'd like to watch something longer. They do seem to pass quite quickly, don't they? I was going to do the retro bit, but I think I'll leave it this week. We had enough of that last week in the um, <laughs> in the live stream, didn't we? So in next week's video, we've got Dean's feature. He's done uh, something for us, uh, made a video for us. And we'll do the retro bit and I'll see what I can come up with and add my bits as well. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope, thanks for sticking with me through the cholera talk. Um, you're all wonderful. Don't forget you can join the members section and I'll be putting some videos out there soon in the members section. Um, when I go out next week, I'll do a reconnaissance and I'll put that in the members section. So don't forget you've got the members section as well for additional content, shameless plug there, sorry about that. It's the join button on the channel. Anyway, it doesn't matter whether you join or you don't join, you just enjoy the videos as you are. Thank you very much, you're all wonderful. Uh, thanks for sticking with this video. Take care and I shall see you very soon in the next video next week. Bye for now.